Thank you, sir. It says FR. It stands for France, I think. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> right. In our context, I guess we're talking frequency response. Frequency response, okay. Well, I think everybody has their own, you know, internal target frequency response, you know what I mean? So to speak, yeah. yeah. Like everybody's looking for a specific thing. Yeah, if you're talking about subjective frequency yeah, yeah. response, or basically what you're trying to, what you're listening for. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of variables involved with that. You well, know? Yeah. I mean, I could think of a bunch of them like, um, you know, okay, let's say, let's start with it listening experience, how long you've been listening to whatever, the music, the headphones, the system. There's all kinds of variables within, sub-variables within that, right? But, well, yeah. you know, I mean, your experience level matters. I mean, if you're new at listening to music, like, in a critical way, then there's verbiage you have to learn to even be able to describe or talk to others about it. Think of all the, like, the words involved just to describe what you're hearing, much less understand what a frequency response curve might actually be telling you. There's a lot to know. I think it's a lot more challenging to interpret what exactly a frequency response chart would mean in a headphone. Most people tend to be able to look at something and they assume some various high frequency region or whatever is not desirable because it doesn't per se fit into the, my particular taste or it doesn't give me a... Or you've seen it before on another headphone and, and so you know you think that peak or dip Maybe, correlates yeah. to the sound of this phone or the next one. In other words, you, you, you automatically assume you assume a lot with frequency response. When you're looking at a simple curve, just you know, 20 to 20K, let's say, yeah. you make an awful lot of assumptions. They're usually inaccurate because you don't really know the device it was measured on, if what you're seeing is a reflection or a dip due to the acoustics of the head it's on or the microphone pickup. Ear pads. Yeah, the yeah. ear pad scenario, you know, which of course would vary depending on the shape of your ears. And your, I mean, what the microphone's picking up in that, on that particular measurement device could be quite different than what you hear. So anyway, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, think about just, yeah, think about just our measurement device, for example. Um, you know, like we use a dummy head, and I mean, the learning curve we go through just to be able to, when we first started doing this, just to be able to understand what it was trying to tell us, you know? And you can't even correlate that to anyone else's measurements, right? Yeah, well, it turns out most of those microphones have totally different internal anatomy. So it uh, is quite challenging to use them as a reference when they're all not quite correlating exactly to how you're going to hear the thing. So I'm not sure how much it really matters in that context. Maybe it's good for a relative difference between a set of headphones if you're using the same rig. But from one rig to another, I think it's quite problematic to do direct comparisons and, and make really any assumptions. And even the same rig, like, you know, you could make a measurement and I could make a measurement, same rig. Yeah, we have make, done this. They could look totally different. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. And it's yeah. just it comes down to placement yeah. and, you know, how much care you're putting into it. I mean, if you really want a decent measurement, it's going to take time. I mean, we've right, measured, yeah, we've measured yeah. thousands of hours, right? We, we know how to measure it. Yeah. We can get consistent measurements now. Sure. But if you're a reviewer or whoever you are, or, you know, or a DIY or whatever, and you're taking these things, it's, and you're taking an unknown headphone and you're trying to measure it, you know, and really, like, show it in, a, in its proper light relative to how the manufacturer designed it, that's tough. You know, it's really tough. You'll get, you can, you can bottom line is I think you could take, the measurements and make them look any way you want. You really I think could. so in a lot of ways, yeah. You know, I mean, you could make, you could break the seal and pop up and, and, you know, just a slight break in seal somewhere on the measurement device or let's say you can't get a good seal on it. You're doing the best you can, but you can't, right? So now you got a hump in the, in the base frequency response and it's rolling off quicker in the base. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so, so now you publish that or you post that. Well, that's not really what it sounds like because, you know, it isn't the way it's fitting your head. You know, it's not the same as on a human head against human skin and bone. Well, I guess it comes down to there's a lot of variables in measuring things. That's huge. And they, I mean, internally, you doing them yourself, like, is the only way you could actually kind of compare it. You doing your own measurements against yeah. your own measurements. And, compared to the sub and comparing it to your subjective. Yeah. Yeah, and that's important. I mean, and that, that boils, that brings us back to the beginning where you've got to really understand the subjective. You've got to really understand it. You know, it can't just be, oh, well, relative to this other headphone or that other headphone. Because what if you get, what, I mean, I've, I've seen this a, a million times in the two-channel world, too. You know, with gear, comparing gear, and of course, most amplifiers measure flat, right? You know, great. But none of them sound the same. So what the hell? Right, right. right. So what's going on there? I mean, you think about that, right? 
And so what the hell's going on there with these amplifiers, right? Well, you know, I mean, obviously the frequency response curve to me is, is really, um, uh, it's just the top of the envelope of what you're seeing in terms of what the sound character of the device is. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's two dimensional really, right? It's, you can't tell what's going on below that curve. You know, and uh, so you're not, it's not necessarily showing you the inner mod or distortion characteristics, um, you know, at lower levels, like 20 or 30 dB down from that, which your ear is going to pick up. But, uh, you know, you're not seeing it on that one graph. And it's not to say that, it's not to say that you can't, me we can't measure that. You could measure all these individual things. But how they combine to get a certain sound or the subjective sound of the device is not obvious. Right. right. You, there's no one graph or even well, yeah. three or four that you look at and and know, oh, I know what that sounds like. It doesn't work like that. Well, it would be nice if you could uh, they were just like put all that information into one number and then it would give you Yeah, one well, number. You know, kind of like a FICA is, score. Yeah, this is this is how good it sounds. <laughs> There's a FICA Out of score. 100. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even things as simple as uh, detail. I mean, everybody could hear different detail in different headphones, but there's no measurement for detail. So No. I mean, it would be nice if there was, but and, and relatively speaking, even between individuals, what's the... Well, that's the other thing, yeah. What is detail? Yeah. How, how detailed do you like it versus you or me, you know, or the music yeah. you listen to? Oddly enough, some people actually don't like excessive detail. Well, yeah. <laughs> Especially depending on so what you're listening to. Right? It's yeah. challenging if you're looking for a target response in that field. Yeah. There isn't really a one-size-fits-all. It depends on your taste, what you're listening to. There's seemingly a huge amount of nuance that you totally miss out on on the measurements. And particularly with 1266, I mean, you could tune them on your head. I mean, that's the whole thing, so. Yeah, yeah I that mean, was the cool thing about it's it. It's kind of, yeah, frequency response on 1266 is kind of personal. In fact, yeah. we're gonna be doing, a, I gotta do a video on that uh, uh, coming up soon about uh, fitment on that thing, like show people to, you know, mm -hmm. once you get used to it, accustomed to it, and have it for a few weeks, your brain starts to get used to the acoustic of that headphone because it's very different than every other headphone out there. Yep. Then we can do more advanced, you know, settings where you say, well, I'll show you what you do with this when you got this music. It's going to be a cool video. But mm -hmm. anyway, bottom line is, yeah, that was the cool thing about the 1266. You can adjust the, the damping of the bass by how you space it and the spaciousness of the sound by how you space it and tow it in and tow it out. And, yeah, you know, where all, all the headphones you plop it on your head, your fixed position, and you're like, okay, let's hope I like this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people get the impression that if you're doing things subjectively, you're not seeking a target response curve. That somehow that doesn't matter. Yeah, really. But the way we do things, we, we have a target. Right, we're mostly doing it subjectively. We mainly use measurements for confirmation, but we're still, of course, seeking a target. Yeah. You know, it's just we know what we're after. We know what right. we're after. We, we've done this. We've been doing this for years now. Sure. So our existing products, we're extremely happy with as are our customers and you know and we we have that in our we have that knowledge that subjective measurement in our heads and um by all means we'll use the same subjective me measurements to you know potentially improve upon future models when the time comes but uh for the time being i mean i'm i'm cool with listening to stuff aren't you guys i mean we're, we're cool with listening to it we know what we want to do we, we're we have a reference given our yeah. own headphones, yeah, we, yeah. that's our reference. So, you know, what else can we do but take that higher over the, over time, right? Or or expand it out into closed backs or IEMs or what have you. But I think I think we have our target curve. So anyway, you know, I, I think measurements are important. I mean, we, we use them. We Anyway, it's not the end all, for sure. Initially, I thought when we started doing measurements, it would be really helpful to get all the, the tiny little intricacies dialed in without having to deal with your internal biases. But it turns out it's so much more challenging. It was than really that. tough. Yeah. It doesn't really provide the value I thought it would most of the time. It added more confusion than anything, yeah. if I recall. It was just, because you're trying to correlate that to subjective, and it's like it's not showing me what I'm hearing. Right. So I couldn't, you know, and no matter what we did, we couldn't pin it down. So bottom line is, yeah, it's a, it's a tool. There's some value for tool. sure, but it you know? certainly isn't a, a reference for say. It, there's so yeah. much trivial little stuff that's going on that's very hard to determine in a measurement. And to bring back to your point too, you were saying I'm too bad there wasn't one number. Yeah. I mean that's that really, you know, if the measurement guys really need to work on that, they might be. I think somebody yeah. is trying to correlate all the distortion measurements maybe across a frequency range with the FR and maybe yeah. come up with more of a three-dimensional, you know, I could picture this three-dimensional image of, you know, like you include imaging and, and 
you know, and somehow include detail in the in the in the, in the picture where you could see sound staging and so on. But I'm, I don't think you could measure that though. I mean, you could measure it, but I don't think there's. I would take think about what it would take. It wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do it with two mics and two ears. You you'd need some sort of wild mic arrangement to put a headphone on, right? That was able to pick out. I don't even think you could do it. I don't think there's any way to do it. There's no way, good way to do it that I could think of, which which is the challenge, right? Well, nobody's done it yet. <laughs> I mean, you could do it. You could do it more with speakers in a room because they can produce enough acoustic pressure to fill a room, and you could load the room with microphones and get a sense of what's going on in a room. But in a headphone, that'd be difficult. You need a lot of sensors and a lot of positions, and it's not something for the faint of heart. And, and in the, in the end, who would care anyway? Because you could just listen to it, right? So, and Seems instantly, what matters, right? instantly, yeah. almost nearly instantly, without all this gear and fancy stuff, I could tell you what's going to sound like or what it does sound like. So that, to me, that's that's kind of the end game, isn't that? What you want to know is what it really sounds like, you know. But it's that is an issue. Important. That is an issue because it's difficult to explain. That the verbiage has to be there, the definitions of the verbiage, and some reference point. That's difficult. But then that's music, man. That's the yeah. way it's been. So anyway, guys, we should probably wrap this up because we're going to go on forever about the uh, same topic and wind up right back where we started from. So anyway, thanks for joining us on uh, this episode of Top of the Line. We'll be at Can Jam New York coming up pretty soon. Come by and see us. And if you have a question for a future episode, leave a comment down below and we'll try to answer it. Thanks, guys. The other thing to consider is uh, I see a lot of people talking about the type of chipsets used or the topology of the DAC, so to speak. You know, like the uh, 11 audio stuff we got is an R2R ladder, and uh, it's a different way to, to go about doing things, but it uh, seems like people make, what would you call it, you know, assumptions based on the chipsets. And, I mean, I guess sometimes rightly so, because typically lower-end chipsets are going to be combined with lower-end amplifier sections. They're implemented in, in lower-end